we mined all the communities free from Frascati and we found uh, more than 70,000 number of changes as well as more than 62 million portraits across all the communities free. So it's from the beginning of the Frascati development. Uh, project, project development. It uh, summarized our approach or the steps that we followed on this uh, study. So first we import the mailing data in the first step. Then once we have the import data, we have a list of uh, commits and from each commit we get the changes. So there are two kinds of changes. One is the code terms, that's the block that are changing together. And there is number of changes also per service. So how many, how many changes this starting file have? This is the server-side analysis for, for the server-side artifact. In the client side, we perform the detection of algorithms using Sora, Sora approach on Frascati, and we get a list of services that are involved in the anti-patterns. So when we have the services that are involved in the anti-patterns, we have the number of changes and the changes details. So now we do need to map it. So how we do it? We do it in the last state, where we find the files related to a service anti-pattern or services, and then uh, via those files, we can map easily the number of changes and services for each services. So we have two types of variable, independent variable, that is the age service entry pattern, and for the dependent variables, uh, that is of course the change promise, so number of changes and backward trends. To go to the state forward to the result, yes indeed, the result shows that uh, service entry patterns, uh, entry pattern services that are involved in the entry patterns are more change prone in terms of the difference between median of two groups. So this is the result for service anti-pattern, the changes, and this is the results for the service pattern and non-anti-pattern both. So they have a big group, a big difference between the median, and this difference is confirmed by the p-value, where it is less than 0.5, so we have the confidence of 95%. And it's the same for uh, code churn. So for the, both the code churn and number of changes, service anti-patterns faces more, and this difference further confirmed by grid delta, where it shows that the, those two distributions are really, really uh, far from each other, so they are not overlapped that much. So there will be a large difference between them. And in terms of uh, the second research question, where we want to see if antipatterns are equally changed from or not, we found that uh, GC, that is got component, multi-service, that is multi-service, MS, then SC, that is service chain, this service antipatterns changes a lot. And this is because what component is a big component that involves lots of other services. Multi-service also has a big, is a big, big service that is, involves a number of many number of operations. And service chain is also a list of services that are working together. So if one change, other it calls also other change. So when designers and developers are designing or implementing services, they should consider or they should take care extra of these three anti patterns. And this uh, differences were confirmed by the p-value, where it shows that it's even less than 0 0.01. So we can, can further confirm the uh, change proneness of this particular few and pattern. But yes, to answer the research question regarding the change impact of anti-pattern on service-based systems and their maintenance evolution, we can see that anti-patterns are more change proneness. So developers need to uh, aware of those uh, now not implementing the anti-patterns while they are designing and developing the systems. And to conclude my talk, we have four challenges in the beginning that I mentioned. So regarding the first challenge, that is no unification of the abstraction. There was no text, uh, specification of anti-patterns. There was no approach to detect those anti-patterns regardless of the technology. And then there was no empirical evidence that anti-patterns are bad for system after maintenance and evolution. And we had Fourth contribution as well regarding those uh, challenges. So we provide a unified abstraction. We provide a service DSL for the specification of anti patterns. We propose the SODA approach and the framework to support the approach. We provide extensive validation of the SODA approach. And finally, we provided a medical evidence for one technology that is SCA that service anti patterns impact the software maintenance and evolution. And we answered what for the first research question by supporting the assum four assumptions positively that we can efficiently uh, specify and detect anti patterns. And in the second research question, we showed empirically that sub service anti patterns are more change prone, so we should be take care of not implementing a service anti pattern. We had some uh, perspective based on our research, our on our current research, 
For the short term perspective, we want to replicate our efforts on more REST APIs since its predominant software architecture, is, uh, software architecture style in this uh, age. And we want to detect more empty pattern as well in the rest. We want to communicate our results like we did uh, for Frascati with real developers for the rest. It also give us our more information and more uh, insights about the anti-pattern and why they implemented those. We want to, uh, apart from the impact study that I did as our first, uh, fourth contribution, so we did only for SCA, we want to also do it for web services and rest. And finally, finally we want to do the evolution study of anti-patterns and like I, how, why, and when they are in, uh, implemented or introduced within the system. It will be interesting to see uh, for the developers as well. For the long-term perspective, uh, we want to replicate our study with our industrial partners to see if our approach works fine with them or if our approach uh, can detect any patterns within their systems or not. And we also want to propose a corrective approach. Currently, we are focusing on the, only on the detection approach. But corrective approach will be the next step after we detect those anti-patterns or bad practices. And finally, once we correct them, we want to check uh, what is the impact of those refactored anti-patterns. So if they really improve the design quality or quality of service of those services. Uh, the, the results I presented in my talk uh, was published in five precedents, proceedings and one journal. And currently, uh, another journal is under review. Uh, I thank you for all for the attention and gratitude my defense. And I'm open to discuss anything I have any questions you have. Thank you. Okay, thank you for presentation. Uh, well, maybe we can start with uh, with questions. And uh, well, we can uh, we have to maybe respect an order for 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 intervention. Uh, would you start, uh, Doctor Elie Sulia, the Doctor Sulia? Hello. Yes. Now we're starting the official examination. I'm not sure how you, you guys run the defenses, but in our case, the seminar is public and there is a bit of public conversation. This is not public, right? Well, it is. It is. It is. Oh, okay. Yes, so, our questions. Can you, so basically, can you tell me how uh, the defense protocol works uh, uh, at your school? I have never attended one before, and I just need to understand the plan. The plan, the first uh, a presentation of the thesis okay. and a period of question by the committee. Okay. And at the end, be from the audience if requested. Oh, and, okay. And then, and then, uh, and then we we deliberate okay. behind the okay. uh, closed room, behind the closed room. Oh. Okay, excellent. Okay, so first, let me just congratulate you on your thesis document. It was probably the best written thesis that I have read, and. I usually do not say nice things about this document, so I, I appreciate the fact that it was so well written and the presentation was very, very good and uh, it was uh, easy to follow and understand the argument of your thesis. Thank you very much. Now, having said that, I do have questions. Now, my first question is uh, on your grammar. Yeah. The grammar that you are proposing is focusing on actually detecting service anti patterns based on metrics. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Your grammar does not allow for specification of REST syntactic patterns, uh, now the word patterns is problematic, uh, REST syntactic expressions to be found in order to support a REST anti-pattern cognition. Correct? Yes. Why did you choose to have a grammar? Could you not extend your grammar to cover both? I find this choice of having a grammar, this model-driven engineering, model-driven construction of algorithms for detection of anti patterns in short services, uh, but not REST. I found it a little bit inelegant. Can you tell me the technical issues that prevented you from doing so, or how would you actually extend it to make it work across the two styles? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the appreciation in the first place and mm -hmm. the questions. So uh, before, uh, yeah, we started uh, the grammar with for SCA, and then we extended it to the web services. And since those were uh, 
these two technologies particular was easy to, uh, I mean, for the services and components to get the properties and to, like, to get the access, uh, access to the interface. So it was easy to uh, apply metrics on those service interfaces. Uh, but for the rest, we started yeah, basically with heuristics in our papers that we presented in conferences. But in, now we are in the process uh, to convert those heuristics to the BNF grammar and uh, rule cards. That's why I also showed the rule cards of the hypermedia that was uh, presented basically as a heuristics in the in the thesis or in, even in the papers. So we are in the process of uh, converting those heuristics uh, because heuristics are more conceptual. So it's the point that you're asking like, for rest is, uh, is looking for syntactic problems or those kind of things is not much easier for using workers. So in the first place, we found heuristics to, to fit more for that purpose. But now we are in the process to transfer those heuristics to workers and uh, extend our DSL as well. Okay, that's good. Uh, I noticed that, that this was something that was new from the thesis. Yeah, it was different. So, but but the more like the underlying question is leads back to your abstraction and meta abstraction languages. In your thesis, I did not see much connection between your conceptual abstractions and your grammar specification. You know, also as I was starting to read, I was expecting, assuming that the whole point of doing this abstraction exercise was that the abstraction will give you a grammar and the grammar will give you the algorithms. Can you talk a little bit about the gap between the conceptual abstraction and your grammar? Yeah, I acknowledge that uh, that's, that gap in my thesis because there was no formal transition from the unified abstraction to the uh, BNF grammar of the specification. So I, I noticed it later, so maybe yeah, I can also concentrate on this gap like uh, in the correction or, or in the review part of my thesis. Yeah, but currently, yeah, the, the, that part is missing. So, mm. I think, uh, yeah, I need to uh, put some effort. Okay. Now, tell me a little bit about your abstraction. You talk about abstraction and meta abstraction, and I don't think that your abstraction is absolute enough. I think it's more composition of the syntactic uh, schemas rather than abstraction. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, it's, it's, it's abstraction in a sense that. Uh, it doesn't, it is not uh, a complete or the whole uh, meta models of the schemas of technologies. So we keep uh, only those parts that are really related to the anti patterns in, in somehow. So most of the entities or concepts in the abstraction uh, might be needed to specify or detect anti patterns. And so I'll really eliminate a number of elements of other things that are not really. Uh, of our interest in the in the specification detection of service elevator. So in that sense, it's abstract, but yeah, it's a combination of uh, different technologies, schemas, and uh, data models. Okay, so, so let me just say that, let me re-say that to make sure that I got it. Essentially, what you're saying is you took the syntactic representations and you sort of aligned them, and if you threw out stuff that is not relevant to your subsequent work. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the meta abstraction is really abstraction. Uh, yeah, meta abstraction is really abstraction. So. And the meta abstraction level is conceptually related to your grammar. Can you explain that part? I mean, quite irrespective of the fact that it's not there in your thesis, tell me the story about how your meta abstraction relates to your grammar construction. Where by grammar I mean what you're doing now, not necessarily what is in the thesis. What is the logic of meta abstraction to the grammar that will lead you to automatic detection? Currently, uh, what I can think about is uh, from my grammar, the metrics I proposed, or the mm -hmm. metrics I have, those metrics are applicable to uh, some of the entities or elements within the meta abstraction. So it, I can think about only from the matrix perspective, but the construction of the rule cards, of the structure of the rule cards, they, they are not really meta abstraction independent. Mm. So only the, only the matrix can be maybe. Uh, applicable to uh, operations or uh, messages or representations or okay. uh, from the matrix perspective. So why do you think this meta abstraction is really important? I mean, what did it do for you? What does it do for the field? Uh, in general sense, it's mostly important for the comprehension of the unification of technologies, as you said, perhaps in your report, but. Uh, 
Yeah, but for our detection, it didn't directly help uh, in such way that you expect. Mm. Okay, that was my first big question, and I have a second one, which is technical and specific. How much time do I have for this first round? Am I? Well, we will have a second round if if okay. if, if, if needed, but. Uh, um, so can I ask? Yeah, yeah, you can. Yes, sure. Okay. So my second question is about your validation uh, process. You said that you had a bunch of people validating the anti patterns you found. Uh, how did you train your validators, and do you have any um, notion that they are indeed good? Do they agree? You know, you have validators, uh, inter validators agreement. Uh, threats to the overall experiment by Lady. Tell me a little bit about your experimental design. Uh, for the validation, yeah, thank you. Uh, for, yeah, it, it's, this was also a tricky uh, part of the validation for us, especially. Yeah. Because for the validation, what we did, uh, we have our results that is returned by the rule cards and the detection algorithms. And we have a bunch of people that are not aware of our detection approaches, even our rule cards. So what we did, we give them the service, service interface or the execution scenario or whatever we have uh, as the artifact, pre artifact. And then we also give them the description of the anti pattern. So we don't give, let them know how we specify them and what is the perception of ours on those anti patterns. So based on their own perception of the description, uh, they manually checked which can be uh, an anti pattern or if we report some of services as anti pattern, if those services are really anti pattern or not. So based on their observations, we calculated our decision on recall. So we took them, we took their notion or perception as our oracle, basically. And did they agree with each other? Do you know that they uh, were uh, yeah, Also, for example, uh, for REST, we had uh, three professionals. And if uh, they don't agree on some uh, parts of the validation, then they mutually discuss so if they are not available, what we did, uh, we took the like majority vote. So, so out of three, if two of them says this, we consider them as, as oracle. So sometimes we took the majority vote, and sometimes if there is, for example, web, soap web services, we have two graduate students, and there is no majority option. So they must comply with uh, one uh, conclusion. So in that sense, in this way. Okay. And for, um, for the sorry, and for the first copy uh, validation, since we are validating with the core development team, I mean we are already uh, rely on them uh, based uh, based on what they are uh, proposing us or what they are suggesting us based on their own uh, development knowledge and history, development history. Okay. So do you feel? And one more question on this experiment. I think you mentioned it in your presentation. Um, even though something is implemented with an anti-pattern, it doesn't mean there's a better way of doing it. Correct? Yeah. yeah. But, so, let me ask you in a bit of a, you know, very offensive manner. How do you know that this work is actually useful to developers? We all know that sometimes there's no right way of doing things. There is complexity in the system and there's no way of hiding it. Eventually, something will have to be high uh, coupling, low cohesion. Something will have to be ugly. So, how do you know which anti patterns are actually meaningful in the sense that they can be fixed? Uh, yeah, this is uh, more about uh, general questions of anti patterns, but uh, based on, on our detection approach or perception. We may call a service as an anti-pattern, but in reality, there might be uh, no other alternatives to implement that service as an anti-pattern. So, in that case, in that case, uh, uh, we might have a false positive, but uh, it's not a false positive. It is a true positive, but completely relevant. You know, it is an anti-pattern, but fine. It is a good implementation. So, do you have any clue on? How will you be able to differentiate between anti patterns that can be fixed and anti patterns that are just a fact of life? Uh, at this moment, we don't have any clue. Maybe there's a mid advanced uh, analysis or bit, uh, we need to do more research on it. I mean, okay. In terms of. Uh, 
Yeah. Currently, okay. we're focusing only on detection, but maybe we have some mm. other aspects to consider, and uh, I mean, there are many other open opportunities for the uh, tool. Yeah, yeah, this is a tricky one. I think I'm good for now. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, thank you. Thank you for your questions. So, maybe you can. Uh, what? What? The local and then supervisors. Well, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I would say I, I, I echo the comment of Dr. Suda. It's, it's a very good presentation, very well structured. We know where you're going. And so was the thesis. I appreciate it. Well written, well structured, clear research questions. Uh, so very uh, interesting and very, very impressive in that respect. Um, I, I enjoyed the um, the fact that it, it was a good validation to you took care of uh, looking at uh, good measures of precision recall uh, impact, looking at real code, just so it's not something else, you know, so that's very appreciated. Uh, good points for the publications too, congratulations for the publication, we always like to see <laughs> the directors as well. So. <laughs> That's what I agree on the defense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Makes the defense easier. Um, now, for, for the questions, uh, let me pick up on, on one question that was asked by Dr. Surya, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, given that it's, a, it's somewhat subjective, right, to, yeah. to, to say this is an anti pattern, uh, it would be uh, nice if you could report kappa scores, for example. So, this is a measure of how good are the uh, judge agreements? Uh, because if there is no agreement to start with, I, 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 I see that they come to an agreement, but if we start and, and there is no agreement, uh, we have a problem. Right? Yeah. The, uh, and that's interesting to know. It's not your problem, actually, because you know, that's their interpretation of what they took out there. And uh, if what they took out there, people can't agree on it. It'd be nice to know. Yeah. In the first so that would be an improvement. Yeah, maybe uh, I can take it to the not and uh, Yeah, usually we report the class okay. and we get a standard score from that. Uh, and then the, the question comes, because I see you have the, the discussion agreement. Uh, question of overfitting. Okay. Uh, did you adjust the rules after that? No, not really. Okay. So yes. we simply go with one rule and uh, we have the results and we are checking with the subjects if our results are good enough or what they think about all the rules. Because okay. that's important, right? Because we want to know if, if they are adjusting afterwards. Uh, because then there would be the question of what we need to run a different mm -hmm. validation structure. There, there, is, there is some approaches, I think, uh, that use genetic algorithm uh, to find the best combination of rules and that will optimize the detection. And once you do that, then you have to run a cross validation, right? Yeah, Training yeah. and then just. Yeah. But, but if you didn't change the rules, I guess. No, I so that'd be important to mention uh, as well. Uh, yeah, 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 it was not mentioned in the uh, this as well, I think. Okay, because it makes a difference. Yeah. Um, second point, it wasn't exactly clear. Maybe you can clarify this. You had a four process, uh, process of four steps. Um, so we define the rules, and then the rules are, are, are I guess you could say they are compiled into a Java code? Yeah, yeah. A Java program? Yeah, it's a Java code, yeah. So that, that's totally automatic, that's compilation yeah. process. Yeah. So the, that Java program can be run and uh, applied on a component or... So presumably you have four different compilers, one for each uh, type of service. Uh, not four, but one for each type of service. You mean uh, compilers? Yeah, because you, you, do you run the same code and you don't run the same code on all four uh, What we mean by templates, so we have templates for each anti-pattern. So, okay. so that is oh, different. Right, for each anti-pattern, but you have uh, one uh, type of anti-pattern is uh, REST. Yes. One. So is it the same code that runs on all Yeah, for, it's the same code for that runs on SCA and uh, web services. But for REST, as I said, we mentioned earlier that it was basically based on heuristics before. So we have um, implemented the algorithms. So now we are in the process of automate, automate the process. So we, now we have rule cards that is more automated. And uh, now, can you tell me what's the input? The example of the input for the for REST process. and then for the 
Java parser. What's the input of the Java parser? Java recognizer. I mean, for this uh, generation or for the whole process? No, for the Java, Java, so you have the Java code? Yeah. What's the input of this code? The input is the basically in the, it's from the scratch, it's the rules. So the rule that is written by the engineer. It generates the Java code in the end. Yeah, it, uh, it, it's taken as a, as a rule and then we process this rule. So the input is rule, but output is the Java code. So what's the end? So that's a detector. Yeah. What's the input of the detector? For the, for the detection? Yeah. Or for the detection, the input is, let's say, here. So we start really from the textual description. And this specification process, we have the rule cards. So this generation process is basically the next four steps that we have. So the real input is the textual description. That I miss you. I miss that one because I thought you would be analyzing APIs. Yeah. Somewhat the input APIs, has to be linked APIs, to APIs. Yeah, those are here. So we have APIs here. So that's we what have, I'm, that's what I was okay, so what, what is it? We have, we, have, we have APIs. So API means if we consider RESTful APIs, we have resources. So resources have a request and response. So re request and response has response header, response body, request header, request body. So this is for the REST. And for the SCA, we have components. So we execute the scenarios in SCA. And we have a bunch of components that are involved in that particular scenario. So those are candidate possible uh, uh, services. Components are not requests, they're real code. Yeah. And so do you the, analyze and this, that, this, this, uh, is this a, the raw, the raw data, like the raw input, or is the input processed? Uh, no, I mean, is, is this <coughs> processed? For the service interface, it's the raw data. So for example, we have WSDL. And we are analyzing WSDL as well as it's their corresponding uh, mock implementations. So we are basically working on raw data and measuring the color correcting the metrics from those uh, raw interface. Okay. And for the request of other yeah, types also of also requests? The raw, yeah, raw data. Okay. Yeah, also so you raw. have the same Java code analyzing these very different type of it? Uh, not very same. So as I mentioned before that for REST, we had uh, like ad hoc, ad hoc algorithms for analyzing those issues. <coughs> but for SCA and web service, we have pretty much similar, so basically similar website uh, and algorithms for analyzing those. Because it's bit, um, one thing maybe I uh, missed, missed to mention, like the framework we had. So the framework we had is uh, based on Frascati. So this Frascati, provides the mechanism uh, to introspect uh, services or components in a neutral manner. So you can, uh, you can invoke or you can uh, call a web service, you can call a SCA service, you can call a REST. And then using Prescati, you can analyze them in a single way or single approach. <coughs> That's the good benefit of using Prescati. And our framework use Trascati, which is SCA based, and Trascati also uh, developed using SCA. So they have a combined uh, good match with the, our framework and the library we are using. That's the good thing. I guess that part is it's still a bit fuzzy for me. Because it'd be nice to see what's the input of the Java code. Okay. Okay. have examples and see yeah, maybe, if they, maybe, maybe. I, and the, because, because the question is, can this be totally automated? Can I use that is our last challenge I, uh, in this moment, so to make it totally automated. So uh, only the rest was our... Uh, and giving an idea of the input would help. Yeah, yeah but so the idea that, that, how that much part, work is involved. That part was missing, yeah. Okay. I mean, giving a concrete uh, visual example, uh, what is the input and what is the output. Uh, yeah. okay. um, Going to back to the input, which were to the uh, impact. The question was also addressed a little bit before. Uh, it's a very tough goal to assess the impact of. of, of yeah, very tough. Yes, yeah. it's a tough goal because you. I guess to to know that you need to know uh, how many of the changes are due to any patterns, right? At some point. Uh, we don't classify in that way, but we classified how many are changes related to that pattern, I mean, or involved uh, or done 
on those source files that are involved in the in the implementation of antiparticles. Because what you did you, is you, you measured, you, you first measured the probe that was linked to an antiparticle, you did the matching, and then you looked at how many of them had changes, and presumably the changes are because of the antiparticle? So we, we don't presume okay. in this way, yeah, we don't presume, but uh, we directly come up with the conclusion based on the...